Good morning, everyone. We welcome you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We also welcome those of you who are joining us via the live stream. You are very welcome to join us this morning or by recording later in the week. Our call to worship this morning comes from that very long psalm, Psalm 119. And you'll be glad that I'm only reading one section of it, the last section. May my cry come before you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my supplication come before you and deliver me according to your promise. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. May my hand be ready to help me, and may I have chosen your ways and your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord. Your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your laws sustain me. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your word. Amen. thinking about that last phrase I have strayed like a lost sheep our first hymn has that wonderful promise O oh love that will not let me go I trace the rainbow through the rain. What a lovely word, lo lovely line that is. Reminding us that, of course, the rainbow was one of the first promises that God actually made to his people. 
and a promise that still holds to this day. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, that we can indeed come apart from the world with all its problems and spend this time with you. Teach us, Lord, to rest our weary souls in you, our source of light and love. May we learn to put our whole trust in you as we meet to praise you, to pray to you, and to hear your most holy word read to us. May our hearts be ready to receive the blessing your word brings. Lord God, we long for your salvation, that you won for us at such a terrible price, and that you so freely give to us through grace alone. We do not deserve your love for us, your straying and lost sheep. And yet in love, you came to find us as you always promised that you would. You still seek us out when we stray away from your ways and we get sidetracked by the world and the apparent attractions that distract us from fully following you. Lord, you know how easily we do get distracted by seemingly interesting and desirable things within the world. Lord, we are sorry that we are so weak and our attention span is so brief. Renew us, Lord, with your love. Fill us anew with the joy of your salvation and with the awe of your grace and the greatness of your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to follow you more nearly day by day. Now we join together in those words that Jesus himself has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing again now. We're going to sing one of those wonderful old hymns. We're still in the season of Easter. And it's a hymn that we don't seem to have sung very much in this church. But it's a hymn that is full of most wonderful lines. There is a green hill far away.
Can we take up our offerings for God's work in this place, please? Lord, we thank you for your endless goodness to us, for all the things that you give us day by day. Lord, teach us to be thankful to you. And take these offerings, we pray, and all that are all the donations that are given to us. May they be used, Lord, to spread and proclaim your gospel here in Butt Lane and far beyond. In the name of Jesus our Saviour, Amen. We have an important announcement, a very important announcement. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock we have the annual General Church Meeting. Now, I know what people feel about meetings. Most, most of us don't like meetings, but I can assure you that tomorrow morning's meeting is actually a very important meeting because we are going to be making some decisions that will affect this church in the coming months and probably coming years. So we would ask you to come tomorrow morning and join in the discussion and contribute to the life of this church. Now Liz is going to come and read to us and then Alice will bring us our gospel. Now if you remember... God promised Abraham and later his son Isaac that a great nation would come from them and they would have many descendants. And last week we heard about Rebecca becoming the wife of Isaac. And they were married for 20 years before they had children. But finally Rebecca became pregnant and guess what? She was going to have twins. Now this story happens after the twins were grown up and it's entitled The Bad Brother. Isaac had two sons. The older son's name was Esau, which means hairy and red, and the younger son's name was Jacob, which means something like cheat. Isaac likes, liked Esau the best because he was big and strong and hairy, and he could hunt. And one day, when Isaac was old and blind, he asked Esau to go and kill an animal, cook the meat, and bring it to him. When you've done that, he promised, I shall tell you what you will get after I die. So Esau ran off, his bow slung over his shoulder and his hunting knife in his hand. But he was in such a hurry that he didn't notice his mother, Rebecca, hiding behind the tent. Which son did Rebecca like best? Jacob, of course, partly because he stayed at home to help her, and partly because he was clever and sneaky, just like her. Rebecca decided then and there that Isaac's promise to Esau should go to Jacob instead. So she went and found Jacob, and together they plotted and planned, and in no time at all, Isaac had a visitor with a steaming plate of meat. Back so soon, my boy. My, that meat smells delicious. Bring it here at once, Esau. The son brought the meat to the father, and the son set it down. But the son wasn't Esau. Here you are, father, said Jacob in as gruff a voice as he could muster. But the old man was not fooled. Isaac may, be may have been blind, but he was not yet deaf. Is that really you, Esau? Come here and let me touch those hairy arms. So Jacob come, came closer, 
and he stretched his, out his arms and wrapped round them were the hairy skins from an old goat. Isaac touched the arms. He felt the hairy skin and he smiled. It is you, Esau, he said. Well, here is my promise. When I'm gone, you will have my land and grow many crops. And besides that, I'm putting you in charge of the whole family. They must do whatever you tell them. Jacob could hardly believe it. So when his father had kissed him, he ran off to tell his mother. And it was a good thing. For not a minute later, Esau came to his father with another plate of meat. I'm back, he said cheerfully, and I can't wait to hear your promise. What? exclaimed Isaac. I've already given my promise away. And he told Esau what had happened. Esau listened, and bit by bit his face grew as red as his hair. Jacob, he shouted, you cheat. One day I will kill you for this. But God was watching, and he had something very different in mind. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Ezekiel, chapter 34, beginning to read at verse 11. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them, as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land in Israel. I will tend them in good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. And then we turn to our New Testament reading, which is taken from John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought them out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own and my own know me. And just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who was oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? May the Lord bless his reading of his holy word. Amen. Thank Liz for her reading and thank you Alice for your reading. What wonderful words those are, aren't they? The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. It's always struck me that God knows us by our own name, each individual. And when you think of the billions of people that there are on the earth, you begin to get a glimpse of how great our God is. Keeping with the theme of this fourth Sunday of Easter, often called the Good Shepherd Sunday, in case you hadn't guessed. We're now going to sing The Lord's My Shepherd and we're using the Townsend version. If any of you know the descant incidentally, especially, especially the ladies please, do feel free to join in. It's a beautiful desk camp.
We're all very familiar, of course, with the image of the Good Shepherd, often pictured with a lamb over his shoulder, which, of course, is actually the picture of the parable of the lost sheep from Matthew 18 or Luke 15. The Good Shepherd going after the lost sinner and bringing him home rejoicing. It's a sentimental picture of a loving saviour reaching out into a hostile world and plucking one of his own lambs away and out of danger. It sums up the sentiments of the 23rd Psalm that Alex read at the start of his service last week. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I always think the Townsend version misses out the last bit. Thou spreads the table in my sight. Because that is the eventual promise, the promise that he's still there. In our passage today, Jesus, in fact, was being confrontational. This was one of his last big public discussions with the Jewish people and with the Pharisees in particular. This passage follows on directly from the story of the healing of the blind man and the rough, bullying way in which he was treated by those arrogant Pharisees who questioned whether in fact he'd been healed. And if so, it must have been by the work of a sinner. If you remember, he, they hauled him in twice, even tried to haul in his parents, who said, well, he's old enough to talk for himself. When Jesus heard how the Pharisees had treated this man, he went out and searched for him. What a picture of the Good Shepherd. He went out and searched for this person who had been bullied and beaten down by these arrogant priests. And Jesus then completed the work of healing. He opened his spiritual eyes to exactly who he was. He revealed to the man that he was indeed the Messiah. The Messiah, no less. The Messiah that the Jews had waited for for centuries. And then he throws a challenge to the Pharisees because they claimed to have spiritual insight, to know all the mysteries. But in fact, he accuses them of being blind, blind to God's work. Our passage today starts with those words, truly, truly. And this is said in answer to their arrogance. He tells them that there is only one way into the sheepfold. And it's not by climbing over the wall. It's by entering the door. He proceeds to explain using a figure of speech that would have been familiar to all of his listeners. The Jewish people were a pastoral people, an agrarian people. They raised sheep and goats. And so the role of a shepherd would have been very familiar to them all. In fact, in the Old Testament, there are 52 references that I came across of God being called the shepherd of his sheep. 
five of them in the Psalms alone. So Jesus is using a well-known idea of God being shepherd and applying it directly to himself. There are numerous, there are numerous references to bad leaders, misguided and corrupt leaders or shepherds of his people. As we heard in the first reading from Ezekiel, we may recall that even in the days of Eli, his sons were a rather poor example. They were corrupt and they did not walk in the way that God wanted them to walk. And that was the time when God chose a small boy, Samuel, to try and lead the people back to himself. Now in the passage from John, he utters the third and fourth famous I am statements in John's Gospel. There are, as you probably know, seven I am statements. And the third and the fourth are both in this. Did you spot them? He's directly confronting the Pharisees by using the very name of God himself. I am Yahweh in Hebrew. The very thing that a Jew would never dare to say. Even when they write in English today, you find that they write G-D because they may not even write the word God. How sad that God, <clears throat> how sad it is that the God we love cannot be named. We name him. As the passage proceeds, his claim is to be one with the Father. And it grows more and more direct until they pick up stones to stone him. But he escaped from that. Jesus develops his theme by first of all establishing that there is only one way into the sheepfold also known as the kingdom of heaven and that is by the door may seem obvious anyone trying to get in by any other way by good works by being spiritual by priestly election or because they think they're worth it is a thief and a robber who only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. A form of spiritual terrorism, if you like, that has no part in the real kingdom that Jesus came to proclaim. At first, they didn't understand this figure of speech, so he spells it out clearly. He Jesus is the door, the only way into the kingdom of heaven. As he was to say to Thomas in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John repeatedly says throughout his gospel that only Jesus is their light and their life. He is the only way to salvation and the only way into God's presence is through the torn curtain of man-made religion. Time and again people in the Gospels recognize just who Jesus is and in him they find the true Messiah. 
the only way into the kingdom. We have the disciples. Remember, he just says, follow me. And they did. Because they recognized that there was something special. We have Peter who actually declared that Jesus is the Messiah. If you remember, who do people say I am? But who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. We have the woman by the well, the Samaritan woman, who recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. We have Zacchaeus, we have all those who witnessed five loaves and two fishes feeding an entire multitude. We see those people who saw amazing miracles. People who'd been lame from birth get up and walk. People who'd been blind from birth receiving their sight. They even saw the dead being raised. All were left in no doubt whatsoever that Jesus was no ordinary man. Now some people have suggested that in this passage Jesus mixes up his metaphors. How can he both be the door and the shepherd? But his listeners would have actually understood this much better than we can. The hillside sheepfolds were rough stone walls enclosing the sheep at night to keep them safe. They had a narrow entrance over which the shepherd would sleep. No wild animal could come in to snatch the sheep while he was there to guard them. Indeed, as he says later in the chapter, none shall snatch them out of my hand. None shall snatch them because he is both the door and the shepherd. Now Jesus was not actually giving new teaching. It was all there in, his, in their scriptures. But so many were dependent upon what their teachers would tell them. Their teachers interpreted their scriptures their way. And like the medieval church, the priests yielded enormous power and wealth. Ezekiel spells it out well. The corrupt clergy had become fat and not, not fed or taught the people the ways of God. Too busy feathering their own nests to care about their flocks. Jesus is being deliberately confrontational and he doesn't spare them. He brings their evil ways out into the light of day and exposes them as the charlatans they were. Painted, whited sepulchres. And we find this with Jesus many times. His message may have sounded new and radical but in fact he himself said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets in other words he taught the spirit behind the law and the words of the prophets he was in no way replacing the ten commandments or any of the teachings of the prophets 
Look how many times he quotes directly from the words of the prophets. Right from the start of his ministry, when he quotes from Isaiah 61 in a synagogue in Nazareth, declaring that that prophecy of Isaiah was being acted out right in front of their eyes. He came to open people's eyes to what was already there. On one hand, Jesus was contrasting the dishonest priesthood of the day with life through himself, where he will lead his people to be saved. As he says, they will have life and life in its full abundance. Anyone who enters the kingdom via Christ, our only doorway, will be saved and led out into pasture. A Hebrew saying, meaning being properly fed and nourished into spiritual health. Only Jesus can do this. He spells out just how this can be achieved. He is the good shepherd and he has the authority and the power to voluntarily lay down his life for his sheep and to take it up again to prove that there is life through that final door that we all face. Jesus goes before us in all of this life and leads us to eternal life with him. Not only does Jesus condemn the corruption he saw all around, but he gives notice that the Jews, the Jews were not the only people that God loved. For too long, they thought of themselves as being God's special people in an arrogant and selfish way. As Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, they were meant to be God's light in the world, the salt of the world. Their faith was not a personal possession of theirs, it was meant for sharing. Again, it's all there in the law. Enshrined was the principle of looking after the stranger in the gate, treating foreigners as natural-born Jews, looking after the poor of the world, leaving the margins of their fields to feed those who could not feed themselves. It was all there, enshrined in the law. But the Jews had treated God as their own personal possession. As though anyone could actually hold God. And they did not share him with the world. Their very temple where they had the inner court for the Jews and the outer court for the Gentiles says it all. God had intended the special people, his people, whom he would nurture and nourish as his agents in the world, to care for the world, not dominate it. That was the message of Eden, to care for the natural world and not exploit it. And we know how ignoring that one has turned out. Christ repeatedly expounds the scriptures. The scriptures that we know as the Old Testament. And he brings out their true meaning. As he says, he has other sheep not of this fold. And he must bring them also to hear his voice so that the one flock and one shepherd. What an amazing vision that is. And yet, 
we're still finding ways to divide up God's sheep to create man-made groupings that cannot be what God really requires one flock, one shepherd not many flocks all led by their own little bureaucratic organizations the church of God needs to repent in sorrow for what it has made of God's kingdom remember the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus joined them on that journey and although they didn't recognize him he expounded the scriptures concerning himself and his mission and afterwards when they realized who he was they said did not our hearts burn while he opened the scriptures to us do our hearts burn within us when we read the scriptures they should do we invite Jesus to walk with us to open the scriptures to us or do we just trust other people to tell us what they mean only the Holy Spirit can truly open the scriptures to us as he is the helper that Jesus promised to send to us the kingdom of heaven Jesus explained is like a wedding feast a celebration of joy and happiness after all his first miracle was to create gallons of wine for a wedding feast a foretaste of life in its fullness one final thought Jesus leads us onward through our whole lives whether they be short or long he leads us through the highs and the lows particularly through the lows he picks us up when we fall and he will in his own time lead us through that door that none of us like to call by its real name each Christmas we sing these words and he leads his children on to the place where he is gone you all know where that came from I see some shaking heads and I see some nodding heads those are words enshrined in the the hymn once in royal David's city and he leads his children on to the place where he is gone and we have just sung in that wonderful old hymn there is a green hill far away there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin he only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in amen Now this is where I confuse myself because the name of the tune is different from the hymn we're going to sing. The hymn we're going to sing is Loving Shepherd of Thy Sheep and it's to a tune called Buckland. Lovely tune.
We come to our time of intercessions. Father, we pray for your church worldwide, scattered in all its denominations, groups, and worship styles. As the great shepherd of your sheep, we pray that you will keep all your sheep within your fold, regardless of our differences and approach, approaches in expression. <coughs> Father, we pray that they will all find that Jesus is indeed the way, the truth, and the life, the only door into the kingdom of heaven. May your spirit wash through your church to empower and spread your wonderful good news to all mankind. Lord God, we pray for mothers and fathers who are unable to afford to feed their children today. And for the people who are going without, so that what little they have can be given to the ones most in need. Lord, we commit those who are suffering into your hands and ask that you will heal the sick and those in pain. We pray for the churches around the world to reach out to those in their communities who need it most. We ask through your intervention, families living in the poorest communities in the world will find themselves facing abundance rather than scarcity. May they praise and thank you for, ever, for your ever-loving care. Father, we pray for organizations around the world who through Bible-based teaching are empowering local churches through training training to bring about community transformation. We thank you that people around the world are learning new skills and confidence to push back the pain of poverty. We thank you that over 250,000 churches last year alone took part in the church and community transformation project and pray that more churches will unleash the power of your spirit in their communities this year. And may we in this country continue to fund this valuable work. Lord, we pray for those in this country who find it increasingly difficult to feed their families even though they're working. While food banks are a temporary fix we pray that the whole ethos of employment might change so that wages once again will cover people's needs. In our future elections we pray that those putting themselves forward will indeed have the needs of their constituents foremost in their minds. Lord, we pray for all those who work endlessly for, the, for peace through negotiations between conflicting sides. Lord, we see the suffering and the pain, the grief and the in injuries, the displacement of so many people who lose their homes and are fleeing conflict areas. Your simple message of peace and acceptance needs to be heard loud and clear. Lord, make us all instruments of your peace within your worldwide church. We also pray for all those that have been affected by flooding recently and who now face the prospect of rebuilding their entire lives. May they receive help to restart their livelihoods and their accommodation. Last, lastly, Lord, we pray for all those who've been bereaved in this last week 
whether through violence of war, knife attacks, or through any other reason. We pray that you will walk with those who are bereaved in their sorrow. May they feel you as their constant comfort and support. And this we pray in the name of Jesus, our only comforter and support. Amen. Our last hymn is there is a wideness in God's mercy it's about <coughs> inclusiveness isn't it May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon us now and remain with us always. Amen.